Welcome to Modern Musings, conversations with the maiden, mother, and crone. Looking at ourselves and the world through the lens of the 21st century. Hello and welcome back. I'm your hostess, Amber Garvin. I'm here with my two co-hosts, Kristen and Cindy. Hello. Hi. And we've got a pretty fun topic this week. We are talking about literary witches and literal bitches, boss bitches, that is. And I know uh, we don't normally say words like that here on the podcast, but uh, it's definitely going to be part of our topic because this week we are celebrating women. And what inspired us to do this podcast is a book that I got for Christmas in, oh my goodness, I keep uh, thinking that it's still 2022, but it's 2023, so I got it for Christmas in 2021, and it is a companion book to the my favorite oracle cards, which are called Literary Witches, and uh, basically the author is celebrating female game-changing authors, uh, as she calls change agents. She's celebrating female change agents that have changed the world in some way or another and written literal magic through their works. I love that. I yeah. love that term, literal magic. Mm. I do. Yeah, and... uh Anyway, there's like a huge list of authors that she celebrates in this book, and I'm not going to name off all of them, just some of my favorites. And uh, ladies, you know, pop in if you hear any of your favorites. Uh, we have uh, Shirley Jackson. I don't know if anybody's um, read... A Good Man is Hard to Find, but that's one of my most favorite short stories. Okay. And uh, we have Sylvia Plath, Toni Morrison. Oh, yes. Yeah, one of my most favorite writers and poets. And uh, Flannery O'Connor. Mm -hmm. Emily Dickinson. Of course. Probably. <laughs> yeah, she's my <laughs> most favorite poet. Um, who else? We have Virginia Woolf. Of, yes. Sandra Cisneros, and um, I love her. Like, I uh, teach a lot of her works in my classroom. And then, of course, Jane Austen, mm -hmm. Charlotte Bronte, mm -hmm. Emily Bronte, Gertrude Stein, Agatha Christie, Mary Shelley, which is something that I'm currently teaching in my class right now. My eighth graders are reading Frankenstein. And uh, this book is just like a celebration and, you know, tells the story of their lives and how they have changed the world. So, ladies, I want to open it up to you. Do you guys have any um, female game changers that you I actually, believe have changed the world? I, ha I have a few authors. Um, I uh, One of them uh, right now, very relevant right now, uh, is Margaret Atwood. I was she about is, to say. She yes. is one of my favorites. And I don't um, know why she's not on this list. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, she kind of her. predicted a lot of things before, uh, things that are actually happening now in our society. Um, she was kind of predicting mm -hmm. that, that that was the course of things to come. And um, the way I see a lot of things moving, that, you know, it is a real possibility. Yes. Um, it's a very frightening. Yeah. A frightening <laughs> concept. Frightening concept that we could go. That, yeah. That we now could. To, yes. Yeah. Um, another one is uh, Ayn Rand. Uh, oh, she wrote Ayn, yeah. Atlas Shrugged, mm -hmm. um, which is. Uh, Anthem, one of my favorite by her. Uh, she, that is, a, it's a very controversial also. Um, and, and both of those have a political, uh, takes on the way our society yes changes and and i think they're they're very enlightening um of course i had i had virginia wolf on there as well so um i there's there's so so many mm -hmm. and um you know i just 
I don't even know where to start with most of them. Those those were the ones that just came, you know, straight to yeah. mind. Um, Toni Morrison, Maya Angelou. And for some reason, she's not on this list either. And I feel like a lot of the ladies, you know, you said Toni Morrison, but I feel like the other three ladies should be mm -hmm. on this list. But, you know, then again... This woman had to pick, like, maybe, you know, 15, 20 authors to celebrate. Right. She can't right. celebrate you every can't female put every author, female author. Right. ever. <laughs> right. But, yeah, Maya Angelou, also one of my most favorite poets. Was Ag Agatha Christie on the list? Agatha I think Christie. she mentioned Agatha Christie. Yeah. 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 Wonderful, yeah. game-changing author for... The mystery. Mystery, yes. yeah, yeah. I was about to say detective. But uh, mystery and... Um, you know, like uh, we're talking about authors, and, and I was saying Mary Shelley's one of them. You know, I was just telling my students the other day, like, how Mary Shelley changed the game for science fiction writing. When she wrote Frankenstein, science fiction didn't even exist. Right. right. And she, it was like one of the first science fiction novels, and one of the first horror novels, even. Mm. Like, uh, she kind of started all of that like the whole whole genres yeah. yeah yeah like a whole genres of science fiction writing and a lot of people don't attribute her to starting the genre of science fiction and of course you know they didn't call it science fiction back then you know maybe somebody else did but that's you know a lot of people I mean, yes, Frankenstein is a horror novel as well, but it's also science fiction yes. because it talks a lot about, you know, the making science. body parts and the science behind it. The science behind animating the body parts. Yeah. And and also uh, something we've mentioned before, I'm, I'm pretty sure, that, that that science fiction isn't just about the science. It's yeah. always about a, some sort of social aspect and yeah, how and the science affects um our social, you know, the, yeah. So societies. And so, you know, that, that definitely was, you know, it was the question, not just of could you animate life mm -hmm. or whatever, but should, you? should you? And, um, and so that, you know, that's a profound, Pardon. that's some exactly. profound thoughts there. We, we so. had a, um, we had a great discussion in eighth grade the other day. They're actually reading, the Frankenstein's gra the Frankenstein graphic novel written by Grizz Grimley, mm. but um, it's uh, basically Mary Shelley's work, and he drew pictures to oh, go along okay. with it. And so he he did like the same like the beginning of the book, and of course um, Frankenstein is also called the longer ver the longer version of the name is called Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. Mm -hmm. So Prometheus is a story about um, a man who gave fire to the mortals. Yes. And, and then um, also there is a quote from Paradise Lost, which is about making a man, make it, God making Adam and Eve. And the quote is, uh, you know, basically says, did I ask you to make me? And so we got into a great discussion with the eighth graders about how Frankenstein was trying to be God when mm. he made yeah. Dr. Frankenstein. Yeah, Dr. 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 Franken, know, yes. Frankenstein is Frankenstein not the monster. Is yeah. not the monster. Well, he yeah. was the monster. But yeah, he sense. was, yeah. in he a was, sense, yes. like <laughs> the monster was more civilized than Dr. Frankenstein. Yeah. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, Dr. Frankenstein was essentially trying to be and play God mm -hmm. when he was making the monster. Um, one of my favorite authors is uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder. Yes. Mom read those books to me when I was little. And and she should be on that list also, of course. Yeah. yeah. And I think the reason that I think she is so special is because nobody else has quite captured that captured life. their entire mm -hmm. life. Right. From start to finish, basically. She has told every little detail that she could recall into a fantastic story uh you know um 
encapsulating this whole time period so yes, that we can yes. understand you know i don't even know if that was her point um but looking back now we can enjoy like what it was like and experience the struggles of the 1800s right living on Definitely. the prairie yeah um an, another one uh, and and people may poo poo me for saying it but jk <laughs> rowling um, because she wrote literal ma- <laughs> well, magic, she did write literal magic. <laughs> yeah. Um, but she inspired another generation to go back to reading. Yeah. Um, yes. Because kids were not, I mean, everything's on TV. They want to mm-hmm. play video games or whatever, That's a very but good point. that it was the, the day and age of video games. Yeah. That and, generation. But then, kids. but then those books came out and, Kids, kids that didn't even read, read Red Harry Potter. Yes, yeah. yes, and so I think that's a that's a transformative um, kind of thing. That's mm-hmm. that's a powerful thing, and she she used a lot of great imagination uh, and a lot of, um, I guess that you know her her children are good. The you know Harry yeah. and Hermione and Ron they're they're good kids, but they make mistakes, mm-hmm. and she. She allowed for that in her books, in children's literature, nonetheless, where children's literature is often oversimplified. It doesn't, uh, a lot lot of older literature doesn't deal with the hard issues like the death of a parent or Mm -hmm. something. And and the evil people are just trying to take control of the kid's money or, you know, whatever. You know, they're not, they're not really literally trying to kill the kids. Yeah. And, um... So, you know, the, these children are dealing with very adult topics, but in in a safe way. Yeah. And and I I have to applaud her treatment of all those things too. So And uh also to give credit for JK Rowling, she was able to effectively write numerous books that are not just for youth. But any Adults, age, like all ages uh-huh. of people yeah. adore those stories. Yes. And it doesn't matter what your skill level in reading is. Yes. Because I find that sometimes, you know, some books might be too hard. So if your skill level isn't quite there, you may miss it's some of the story. Literature for everybody. But yeah. even even though it is a youth novel, adults can see the depths of it mm-hmm. and... Um, you know, well, it, and it and it, it also, and yeah. we've talked about this before too. How uh, I think it was back when we did the Lord of the Rings versus Harry yeah. Potter episode uh-huh. that we talked about how the books um, aged with the characters, mm-hmm. like the complexity of the books, yeah, changed yeah, as with Harry the age got older, as yeah. Harry got older, as the readers got older. So um, I I like that about it too. That's that is not an easy feat. Um, that takes a lot of forth, foresight um, to plan that out and to to implement that. So, um, so I have to give her a, a couple of kudos for that as well. I think another author that I want to mention that uh, kind of did groundbreaking things in the nineties. Um, I know dystopian literature had been around with Ray Bradbury, George Orwell. Mm-hmm. But um, it hadn't been really been for kids, and Lois Lowry came in mm. with The Giver yeah. mm-hmm. and made dystopian literature accessible yes. to kids. And then all of her predecessors after that, Suzanne Collins, who wrote yes. The Hunger Games, and Veronica Roth, who wrote Divergent, I feel like, um, you know, people... My age, I mean, I read The Giver when I was, I think, a freshman or sophomore in high school. Mm -hmm. And so all of these authors are around my age. I feel like they also read The Giver when they were in middle school or high school. And And that inspired them to go and write a dystopian novel because I remember reading The Giver one year with my students at the beginning of the year and then we were going to end the year with another dystopian novel and um, the kids were, you know, we were reading it and one of my students said, well, this is basically The Giver but with more action. And (laughs) so then it got me thinking like, okay, this author 
is my age and mm-hmm. I read The Giver and The Giver inspired me to write things. So that's basically where all mm-hmm. of this new age dystopian literature is coming from. Yeah. Because, you know, a lot of kids my age read The Giver in high school and it inspired them to start writing so, so are there, um, you know, we, our title is obviously literary witches and we've talked about some of these magical yeah. literary witches. What about some of the literal boss bitches? Cause you know, there are so many powerful, influential women that have done things, um, for us or, you know, for society or whatever, um, or have, have moved the women's, uh, interests forward, um, you know, did I, I was um, when we were doing research for this, yeah. I came across a um, an article on Good House uh, on Good Housekeeping's mm-hmm. uh, website. And it was one hundred and twenty women who changed our world. And yeah. I was reading through this list going, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. So um, I wanted to get us in into that because I I have a lot of those that I want to talk about that I think are pretty, um, interesting. I'm, I know a lot of female authors, um, but I, being not an English teacher Mm -hmm. or an English major, um, you know, I can tell you which ones I like, um, but I can't always, um, tell you why they're so influential or, or whatever. But, um, but I do know a lot of very, powerful women in throughout history and um i'm i'm kind of curious what you guys think about that because i love the idea of a boss bitch um that is um kristen and i used to belong to a facebook group it was called the boss ladies um but it but it also brings up that um britney spears song um you gotta work bitch you know um because it's really the the hard workers the the women who have that work ethic that that defy the norm that do something outside of what other people would consider comfort zone mm-hmm. um and and those are the women who who make history you know they they i think there's like a little meme that goes around that something about quiet women never make history you know right right yeah, yeah. um and I would love to be one of those women someday, but I don't know if I have the gumption in me to, to stand up to that norm, you know, and there's, there's so many who do, and I'm going to start with one who, um, passed away not that long ago. Um, Barbara Walters. Um, okay. Yeah, definitely. She, like, uh... uh, and, and the reason I say this is because she, you know, she was, a a powerful female anchor interviewer, um, reporter, and but at the time that when she first really started, she was told over and over again, "You'll never be able to do this." You you know she had a speech impediment. Um, she was a woman. She you know they just gave her all these reasons, and she is probably without a doubt one of the most powerful female news reporter anchor whatever that I have time. ever known. Yeah ever and uh, she has interviewed some of the most influential people and 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 not silly fluff questions we're talking she asked the hard questions the Mm -hmm. you know she put people on the spot and i i just give her a lot for that you know she's that's incredible yeah I guess uh, one that I want to mention, she was also on television and she um, paved the way for women as far as, um, I know she wasn't the first woman that ever had a talk show, but then she also paved the way for LGBTQ women. And I'm talking about yeah, Ellen. Ellen. Yes. Yes. Ellen. Yeah, Ellen like I, yes. I have always looked up to Ellen. Mm-hmm. And yeah, uh, she came out of the closet before as, people came out of the closet. Yeah, before people came out of before the closet. Before people yeah. came out of the closet. Yeah, definitely. And and on her her sitcom, you know, she mm-hmm. came out of the closet. 
um, before she had her talk show, she yeah. was just doing her little sitcom. And she came out of the closet on her sitcom, too. And, you know, there was a lot of backlash yeah, about that. A lot that. of controversy. And, I remember yeah. that. So, I, you know, that's a, it took a lot of strength and gumption. Right. To, to put her to, career on the line on the, in yeah. front of the world. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, she did it all with a great sense of humor. And I really yes. applaud that. I mean, I just love Ellen. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of um a lot of women who um have done things like that that are um another one that's a talk show host is Dr. Ruth Westheimer. Oh, Dr. Ruth. Dr. Oh, yes. Ruth, yes. Because she was an older woman um and this is like the 70s, the 80s. I, I I'm not even she sure where this television to a place that had never been before. Right. She, she started conversations. She yeah. started talking about um, sex and sexual function and things like that publicly, you know, in, on her talk yes. show. And it, um, in, in the, this call in format or what, you know, and that and normalized it for people. She normalized it and she, ma- how many people did she help? You know, that. That's amazing. That came on TV every week at, <laughs> at South Plains. I remember oh, yeah. <laughs> my roommate and I, we would watch it because it was just like, you know, and I, and I look back and I'm like, I'm kind of glad I did because I was a young woman and I needed that. Well, there's a lot of misinformation out there, there and, and and nobody was talking about things right. at that time. And and so she kind of, it was almost the the healthy part of the sexual revolution, you know? Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. And and speaking of the sexual revolution, you know, there's there's all kinds of things like that. Um, uh, Georgia O'Keeffe, not part of the sexual revolution, but um, her artwork was um, very sexual. Sexual, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, I'm trying to think. Um, Helen Gurley Brown, the she was the editor of Cosmo for. Oh. Okay. 30 years or more. Um, she also wrote Sex and the Single Girl, a very controversial publication. Um, but Cosmo opened up sex the way Dr. Ruth did on television. Um, Cosmo format. did it in the in the magazine format. And it's still, because of yeah. what she did, a very influential magazine to this day. Okay, I've got one. Uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, oh, first yes. woman on the Supreme Court. Yes. And uh, that definitely has paved the way for a lot of women to go to law school and mm-hmm. or, become lawyers and serve as judges. And become the next Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, uh, she's another one of mine. And and I don't even necessarily agree with her topic or her politics all the time. But she, she too, was a very powerful, influential woman um, who stood her ground. And there's, there's a lot of... Um, I, I, I'm looking at the list that I made here... Um, you know, particularly with women who stood their ground, um, Margaret Thatcher, um, who was the prime minister of, uh, the UK. Yes. Um, she, she stood her ground many times. She talked tough and other world leaders were afraid of her. And I, I'm not sure if I'm saying her name right. Um, Malala Yousafza. I, I'm not sure how you say her name. Um, Y-O-U-S-A-F-Z-A-I. She was the Pakistani girl um, who won the Nobel Peace Prize at the age of 17 for standing up for um, Pakistani women's rights to education. Oh. And she was so influential that um, she, I think it, uh, I'm not sure it was a Taliban maybe um, shot at her when she was just 15 years old while she was riding on a school bus. Um, th- you know, they tried to assassinate her mm-hmm. and, um, and she was very outspoken. She stood her ground. And even after she was shot, she continued um, 
to fight for mm-hmm. for women's right to education um and so she's only like 25 years old now and she's already um won a Nobel Peace Prize she's been nominated several times and um and sh- and she was just just a very powerful mm-hmm. speaker and um and that you know is making reforms yeah i think the the thing that's in common with all of those people are that they're very passionate about something Mm -hmm. and that's what drives them to do what it is that they do you know because they believe in something it's not just like you know they became powerful because they went to their job every day and like clocked in and clocked out yes but you know they stood up for something that was right yes yes I, I agree. And, um, and some people, um, you know, some people may say that they've, you know, it's because of their, like you said, because of their job, but not, not everyone has, um, a job like that or whatever. And, but they can still become, um, a powerful person or make a difference that another one that we were talking about earlier before we uh, started this recording uh, Kristen and I were talking about Helen Keller and her teacher, Ann Sullivan. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and younger people are not as familiar. I know when I was in school, they taught us about um, Helen Keller when I was in school, like third or fourth grade. Um, yeah, they don't really they don't really talk Helen about that anymore. anymore. But um, at the time that um, you know, well, she she was an activist, but. She actually lost her hearing and her sight at the uh, age of like 19 months, I think she was, um, from an illness. And um, I don't know how old she was, like probably seven or eight by the time Ann Sullivan came to teach her. But they basically developed a type of sign language um, that she could do blind because she wasn't able to see someone making signs. And so they figured out how to do it in her hand. And um, Ann Sullivan was her teacher and and basically helped her learn to speak um, to some extent. And, um, and she went on to be an activist for handicapped people, for, you know, deaf and blind people. And she um, was the first... I think she was the first deaf and blind person to graduate from college. Uh, El- Helen Keller was. And um, she she's just an example of the fact that uh, up until that time, you know, they thought, oh, if you're deaf and blind, you're, you're never going to be anything except a burden onto your family. And she was the proof that you could go on and have a normal mm-hmm. life, that there – the the things you're calling a limitation um are just constructs in your expectations yeah basically and um and so you know it really is um you can you know the showing that you could do whatever you wanted to do okay um speaking of somebody that uh innovated through adversity such as that uh temple grandin uh she paved the way for you know, made more awareness for people with autism disorder. She paved the way, and she also helped the livestock industry as well. But, um, yeah, she uh, you know, she has autism, and uh, she brought a lot of awareness about autism to the world and how people with autism react to things and oh. neurodivergent people react uh-huh. to things. One okay. that I wanted to mention was Rosa Parks. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, I mean, there were several um, people, you know, um, trying to make a difference in that time period mm-hmm. and, and uh, hers was the Montgomery bus boycott. You know, she didn't want to give up her seat. And um, that's kind of like someone I was thinking about. Um, you know, they were passionate about something. It didn't, it wasn't her job or, um, you know, her primary function in life to right. ride the bus. It was just something that she did every day and she just stood up mm-hmm. for her rights. And um, sometimes it's, 
it's not something that requires, you know, going to school or training and preparation for, um, you know, I'm sure she premeditatively did it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's just you like going out there and like taking that, put your heart on the line, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about, um, mother Teresa? Because that, <clears throat> that made me think of that, you know, like, because she didn't go, well, I mean, she did go to training. She went to school to be a nun, you know, right. but, but at the same time, it, it's all heart, uh, you know, everything, all the influential things that she did, all of the things that she did to help people, um, all of that was born out of her love. And, um, so I think she was another one. Well, uh, to get political, I know, uh, so somebody that has definitely changed the world and a lot of young girls look up to her would be Michelle Obama and, um, all of the amazing strides that she has made battling childhood obesity mm -hmm. over the world and, mm -hmm. All of, you know, the things that they used to serve kids in school. Right, right. And all of her strides to help battle that problem. And that is, you know, she's one of the first, you know, she's the first first lady that has really taken on that. She's, she's not the first first lady, though, that took on big challenging things because well, no, just like, there was, I was talking about childhood obesity. Oh no. Yes. Yes. But I, I was just thinking, um, Nancy Reagan, um, was had the, just say no to drugs. Um, oh, yeah, thing also. True. Yeah. And, um, and that was a, a big movement there, you know, and a, a lot of people make snide remarks about her, but she was very, um, very, committed to that idea you know that we could stop it you know nip it in the bud before it starts you know kind of thing i guess um eleanor roosevelt oh gosh she was yes like, you know especially to have served um as the first lady during wartime um and and a lot of the things and she was uh, an advocate for pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, uh, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, she had a lot of, uh, influence as well. Uh, okay. Uh, what about in, this person just recently died? Queen Elizabeth the second. She was actually on my list. She was another one. Yeah. Um, she was uh, like one of the first, um, let's talk about pulling up your bootstraps. Oh yeah. Well, well, she's, she was one of the first British monarchs, um, to not take a regnal name. She actually yeah. used her own given name. Um, and she was kind of thrown into the whole mm -hmm. thing. You know, she was, uh, you know, her father became King because, his brother abdicated. Yeah. And so, um, and then he died young. Her father died young, um, relatively young. Death. It yeah. was, a, it was very yeah. sudden. Um, and yes, she had been prepared, um, for that at some point, but I think she thought she would be much, much older. And she, if I'm not mistaken, she is the longest ruling British monarch. I, think so I, yeah. I believe so um and and she was much beloved um even even when people disagreed with her stance on things mm -hmm. um she was still very much loved and so um and she some of her policies as well i think made a, a huge impact on the world and leading off from that princess diana yeah, mm -hmm. I was just thinking um, that, speaking of the royal family, Princess Diana. Because she, not only um, her her AIDS activism, mm -hmm. um, her human rights activism, um, you know, all over the world, and also her bringing to the world's attention some of the flaws, uh, perhaps not intentionally, but yeah. the flaws of the monarchy, and which have in later years actually led to changes in mm -hmm. the monarchy, the way that things are handled. And I, I think that's a, 
a major thing. And she, she was, yes, she was the longest. She, I, I thought she was for seventy thought, years. Yes, that's like incredible. Yeah, yeah. And um, what about her predecessor, Elizabeth, Elizabeth the first, the Virgin <laughs> Queen, quote yes. unquote Virgin Queen, but um, she was really game changing as Absolutely. well. Absolutely, she refused. As she refused the to marry. Mm-hmm. Um, she. Uh, changed England from a Catholic state back to a Protestant state. She, well, it was definitely like a, there was, a, yeah, she, there was a lot going on. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, uh, her father changed England from a Catholic state to a, Protestant. to a Protestant state just so he could marry her mother. Yeah. <laughs> and then her older sister changed it back to a Catholic yeah. state you know by killing everybody <laughs> and so she really kind of controlled the chaos yes, that was happening yes, yes and and had enough foresight to realize that the only way to salvage great britain mm-hmm. was to unite great britain with scotland yeah. um by making the heir of mary queen of scots the king in yeah. her, you know, when she passed. So, mm-hmm. um, so that was, that was, she, she thought it through, you know, she yeah. realized that by making him, uh, he's a Scottish king and, but he also had the, the British lineage. He, he married the two, you know, yeah. he, he satisfied both factions and, um, and I think that was that took a lot of strength for her to um, to buck the norm, you know, by not marrying, and also um, to think ahead to that and yeah. and make that happen. And uh, she was also a fan of Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody that's a fan of Shakespeare, right? <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Before her, um, it was actually the church had made it illegal oh. to have plays and um they had to build theaters across the river in the poor town oh. because um the church thought that it was a sin to be an actor okay and that it was illegal in the city limits to hold plays and be an actor and um she was a patron of the arts. Okay. So she was kind of game changing as far as bringing the arts to London. Very cool. And, Very cool. You know, instead of them being banned. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And speaking of the arts and acting, uh, what about uh, some game changing actors? Meryl Streep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like uh her role in um God, Sophie's Choice? No. What is the one where she's the the Silkwood? It was the movie after Sophie's Choice. Um and I was trying to think what it was, but it um it had her and Cher and was it Kurt Russell? Maybe. Maybe. And, yes. And it, and it's a it's about um they were working in in the nuclear reactors and she was trying to unionize the laborers and got, um, some say intentionally contaminated. Um, and so that was just a really, um, powerful role. And, but she's always been a very, uh, powerful actress and, um, a lot of very, uh, striking roles, I guess, is is what I'm trying to say. Um, Sophie's Choice, Silkwood, um, Out of Africa. Um, I'm I'm just trying. So yeah, probably just... one of the most Oscar nominated females. Oh yeah, in history. Um, she was in The Hours, which is uh, about yeah <laughs> literary witches. Literary witches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. So you know, there's yeah, there's a lot of a lot of stuff that she's done that are just fabulous. Um. Who's that woman who fought? Um. Oh my gosh, I can't think of her name. They made a movie about it. Um. 
I guess it was where they had like the nuclear power plants in that town and the people were getting like in like they were getting like some negative effects of the power plant. Oh, um, oh gosh, what is her name? Was it the power plant? You're you're talking about the one that was the actress was um Julia Roberts. Yeah, yeah um, okay, then that's Aaron who? Brockovich. Aaron yes. Brockovich, yes. Yes, Aaron Brockovich, not not Julia Roberts, Aaron Brockovich. Yeah, the actual woman. Yeah, yeah is is a literal boss bitch. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's a massive bot, boss bitch right there. Um, I'm I'm trying to think of some others. Um, I I have like I said I have this list. I'm just kind of going through these. Um, uh, Margaret Sanger actually, um, I believe she founded the American Birth Control League which um, later became Planned Parenthood. So she Mm -hmm. was um, game changing for all women because having birth control, um, being able to plan your parenthood to a time that is convenient to you, whatever, you know, however that works, um, that has changed women's potential for having careers so i mean you know that is another huge huge game changer there um another one uh it's a little more recent um but not as recent as you think is tarana burke she actually founded the me too movement before they started using it as a hashtag Mm -hmm. so um you know the and the me too movement has made major you know major that that realization yeah, so, um that that's especially in hollywood oh like, yes uh, yes how many like some of your favorite actors were accused of sexual harassment right. and like how many people got blacklisted and from hollywood you know because they thought that that was okay right well i think that's the thing is that a lot of that culture didn't realize well or they they turned a blind eye to the fact that it actually is sexual harassment Mm -hmm. they um so it kind of redefined what sexual harassment is you don't have to be raped or groped necessarily to be sexually harassed um, and a lot of times there's there's lots of different levels of that harassment mm-hmm. and it's still just as offensive and just as harmful. And I think the the Me Too movement um, was really helpful in seeing how pervasive it is in our society, not just in Hollywood or other parts of the entertainment industry, but in all aspects of our culture any, and any workplace yes any workplace and um ann landers and abigail van buren oh those wow. are some names you haven't heard in a while um no. that ha- um as as you may know ann landers and dear abby um syndicated um columns advice columns uh all over the the u.s how many people have they helped by giving uh, usually pretty sound advice by having that uh, neutral party to to yeah, look just, at your case and or whatever yeah. you know and tell you give you that advice talk about and anonymously you know you're anonymous so I thought I thought that was a, another really good one they um, several of these just in case you're wondering like I said I'm I uh, found the good housekeeping list of 120 women. And so that's where a lot of these, um, actually came from. So, um, and I have tons and tons and tons more. So, um, there's actually one that Kristen and I, uh, watched a movie some years ago about, and that is Julia child Mm -hmm. because, um, she became a French chef in a time when women were We're not not. chefs. Um, that paved the, and she, she had some gumption and, um, she worked really, really hard. If you've never seen the movie, um, Jules, Julie and Julia, Julia, Julie and Julia. Yes. Um, great movie, great movie. And it's, it's really kind of half about Julia Child and half about, uh, a blog writer who is, you know, trying to get 
uh, trying to break into the writing, you know, uh, paper syndicated, whatever. And, um, she takes on Julia Child's, uh, joy of cooking as the topic for uh, her. No, it's the, they're her French joy of cooking was not written by Julia Child. Oh, it was you're like right. a mastering the art of French cooking. Yes. Okay. And thank you for the correction. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, anyway, so she takes on that book and works her way through the book and, um, and that, uh, leads to these little snapshots of Julia Child's life, but it was, mm -hmm. it was quite fascinating. And, um, Oh, and uh, Meryl Streep played Julia Child. Yes, she did. <laughs> In she the movie. Did. Yes. Another great role. Um, oh, gee, there's just so, so many. I mean, we haven't, we haven't mentioned Oprah, Oprah Gloria Sci Steinem. Different scientists. Uh, Marie Curie. More, yeah. I mean, she discovered radioactivity. Um, in fact, I think she actually, she coined the name radioactivity. Um, and she was the first person to recommend using radiation therapy to treat cancer. And then you got Martha Stewart, first, uh, self-made female American billionaire. Mm -hmm. Susan B. Anthony helping women get the right to vote. Yes. Yes. Um, Harriet Tubman. Yes. Who, um, helped. Thousands and thousands, thousands of, of slaves. slaves. Yes. Um, Juliet Gordon Lowe, the founder of the Girl Scouts of oh, America. How could I not thought of her? <laughs> <laughs> Chris, if you for you, those of you who don't know, Kristen is a Gold Award Girl Scout, um, and I was a Girl Scout leader for many many years. And um, Juliet Lowe uh, went to England and. Um, met with Lord Baden Pole about his boy scouts. And, um, she was so fascinated with what he was doing with boys that she brought that program back to the United States and introduced it to girls. And it, um, thus the invention of the girl scout cookie as a way to fundraise. She taught the girls to love camping and the outdoors and, um, inspired girls for generation mm -hmm. after generation after generation powerful powerful female leader there um i wasn't in girl scouts but i was in the offshoot campfire girls oh yes that <laughs> yes done by the which ymca I, yes or which the i call yeah. the preppy girl scout because <laughs> uh, we glamped instead of camped ah uh, um what about uh danica patrick and along with, yeah, she's, um, you know, one of the first female race car, race drivers, car drivers yeah. who's really stuck with it. Mm -hmm. But before her came Janet, Janet Guthrie, Guthrie mm -hmm. who uh, was the first woman to race in the Daytona 500 in back in 1977. Oh, wow. Yes. And that's uh, another Amelia Earhart. Yes. Yes. And, and there was, uh, and I cannot remember her name. There was a, a black female pilot i remember learning about her during girl scouts and um and i cannot remember what her name was are you talking about bessie coleman that may be her name i'm not sure i can't remember um i just remember reading about her um in girl scouts and i don't remember what merit badge we were working on or anything but i remember her um another one uh, and that we learned about in Girl Scouts was Dorothea Lang, the photographer. Uh -huh. um, she's um, very influential uh, to, for women to become photographers. And um, going into the environmentalist group, uh, Jane Goodall, mm -hmm. her work with the gorillas um, and uh, primates in Africa was groundbreaking. Um, we learned so much about uh, the loss of their habitat and um, the societies of the primates and things like that. And her research has had profound effects on um, environmentalism. Wow, those are some really great ladies that we've mentioned. Um, do you guys have anybody else that y'all want to talk about? 
Well, I mean, I could go on and on and on. Um, there are so many entertainers and environmentalists and activists and athletes. Um, I, yeah, we didn't I even get into that. Really, I, the athletes. I know. <laughs> I, there, there's so many. Um, there's, there's women in fashion like Coco Chanel. Um, you know, people who have changed, Mary Kay Ash, who founded Mary Kay, mm -hmm. um, things that have changed things for women. I mean, there are so, so many, uh, we could just go on and on and on. And I, at, at this point, I don't even know what I'm going to write, you know, on my blog. So, <laughs> you know, especially if we like go back to literature, I could go on and on and on. Oh yeah. But uh, instead let's uh, take a pause for right now and what are we talking about next week? Next week, we are talking about relationships and role reversal within your relationship. Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah. I'm, I look forward to talking about that. Um, well, since we're wrapping up, let's, th let's give some special thanks to people. Red Door Studios and Creative Audio Tech for our music and recording equipment. And we'd also like to thank our listeners. And uh, y'all hit us up on MMC Chat. That's our Facebook group. And let us know who your favorite boss bitches are. And check out our blogs. Because if you're listening, then you're only here for half of the conversation. You need to check out our blogs for the other half of the conversation and uh, give us a shout out there. And also give us a rating. Give us some stars. Give us a review. We want to hear from you guys. Hear, hear. Mm, yeah. I agree. Okay. Well, that being said, have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye.